Welcome to the Happier and Healthier Podcast. I'm your host, Maria Marlowe, and this is a place where we don't rely on good luck or good genes for our health and happiness, but rather we create it with our thoughts and our actions each and every single day. Each week, I'll bring you a thought or a guest that will help you live your happiest and healthiest life. Are you ready? Welcome back to the Happier and Healthier podcast. It's been quite a while since the last episode. We were on a little hiatus for about six months as I'm working on a few new projects, which I cannot wait to share with you guys. But in the meantime, I have a very special episode lined up for you. And this whole season is going to be amazing, which I really can't wait to share these interviews with you over the coming weeks on everything from herbalism to hormones to resilience. So you have like an amazing season lined up. But for today's episode, for the first episode back, I wanted to do something special and something hard hitting and talk about something that has been on my mind a lot lately, which is aging. I feel now that I'm uh, 34. I, for the past year, like I'm starting to see signs of aging. You know, I look in the mirror and I see a little line that wasn't there before or some gray hair sprouting up more than I'd care to have. So it's just something that's been on my mind coupled with Instagram, social media, just always seeing these images of perfection and always seeing these images of youth. So I wanted to start a conversation about this topic. And instead of doing it by myself, I decided it would be fun to bring on two of my girlfriends so we could have a really honest, authentic chat about aging. So to help me out with today's episode, I have Tara Kangarlu, who is a very accomplished and well-respected journalist, humanitarian, and a newly published author. Her book, The Heartbeat of Iran, just came out and it's getting some amazing press. So definitely check it out. My friend Jenny Sachs is also here with us today. Jenny is a former client and now friend. I think she did one of my group programs, what, six, seven seven years ago and has become a very dear friend. She is a corporate lawyer, very into yoga and Ayurveda and just an amazing, generous, kind, gregarious human being. So thank you both for being here. My hope with this episode is to change the conversation on aging and normalize aging, particularly among women. I think that aging has become something that we fear when it really shouldn't be. And all this messaging that we get around aging, that we need to remain young in order to be lovable and successful and all that jazz, it's just BS and it really needs to stop. So I want to use this episode as a launch point for a conversation, for changing this narrative around aging and what it means. Aging is a privilege. It is something not everybody gets to do. So the fact that you do get to live another day and get a day older is something that should be celebrated. Aging is not something you should feel ashamed of. It's not something that you should feel like you have to hide. And it's not something that should make you feel bad. So let's kick it off. How do you guys feel about aging? I'm turning 36 next week, and I feel pretty good and pretty wonderful, but I feel like I should feel like I'm getting old. Like other people think once you turn 36, that's like now you're almost 40, but it's not true. Yeah, no, it's so interesting. I remember, I mean, I can remember being in my early 20s and thinking that 30 was old. And now that I'm 34, I'm like, wow, it's really young. Yeah. (laughs) And what about you, Tara? It's interesting because I have two different feelings about this. On one hand, I don't want to age. I'm 34. I, I just turned 34 in March. But then on the other hand, I look very young. So when people see me, they think, you know, I'm in my 20s. And, you know, the nature of my work, you know, I'm a journalist. I, you know, travel the world. I I cover very serious issues. And sometimes I have found that, you know, people don't take me seriously because I look so young. And, you know, I remember so many times I was, you know, at CNN and Al Jazeera and, you know, I would go to a meeting or something and they think I'm an intern. I'm like, no, I'm the producer on this. And and so I don't know how I feel from that aspect, right? But I mean, of course, I, I also don't 
like to feel old or get old or show that I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I kind of felt like I would never get old. You know, I know it sounds crazy. I guess everyone really feels that way. You just think that you'll never get old. And then one day you wake up and there's like a gray hair. Although, to be honest, I had like one gray hair. I can remember being in my 20s and coming down the elevator and there was a mirror in my elevator and there was like one two inch hair, like gray silver hair standing straight up and I almost had a heart attack. Plucked okay. it out immediately. <laughs> so I have a lot to say about gray hair, Maria and Tara. So I started going gray when I was 15. Both my sister and I, my sister is old, four years older, but I started going gray when I was 15. When I went to college, your experience of your hairs. Uh -huh. So every Sunday night, my roommate and I would sit and she would pluck my gray hairs out. Oh. Starting at 19, I started dyeing my hair brown, dark, my, my hair's light brown, but darker brown so much that I didn't know what my hair was until I'd say, let's see, five years ago. So when I was like 30, maybe 31, my hair is like 70% gray. So I decided to start dyeing it blonde because it would, it would blend better. And I fantasized about just going gray. Like, this is something I fantasized about for years. And aging and this topic are so intertwined. My sister, who I love dearly and is wonderful, also completely gray now, said to me, as did my father, over and over, do not let your hair go gray until you get a man. Like, ah. you're 32, you're 33, you're 34 and single, you cannot let your hair go gray. People are going to think you're older. You won't be attractive. And it was so like offensive, but also so deeply ingrained and deeply ingrained in our society that it was this fantasy, but I never thought I would actually do it. And then I have to say, I think COVID has been a blessing for women. I don't know if you guys follow, but I, there's like a whole community on Instagram of silver sisters. And I think the uh, first lockdown was, you know, three months of like, I just let my roots grow. And then I just was like, I'm just going to let it go. I don't have to go back to work. Just let it go. Let it go. And now it's been 16 months and I'm just going gray and I love it. And I have to say, I think it looks awesome. I think people still think I'm blonde, but still my sister, the second she was able to go back to get her hair dyed, she went back. And every time she sees me, she's like, are you going to make an appointment yeah. to get your hair dyed? And it's still, you know, like being fully gray at 36 seems scary, but I kind of am loving it. And I'm grateful that the pandemic gave me and other women, I think, the opportunity to finally allow that. And I feel like myself, like I find, I cannot tell you the amount of anxiety and like pressure that there was, which seems ridiculous, but. Well, was. that brings up such a big point here is that society is from every angle telling us we need to remain young. We need to dye our hair. We need to cover our grays. We need to Botox our foreheads. We need to use these anti-aging creams and and we need to remain young if we want to get a mate, if we mm -hmm. want to be successful, if we want to be lovable, right? We're, we're constantly getting this message, not just from Hollywood and magazines and, and the media, but also, like you're saying, from our family and our friends. And I'm sure they're, they're well-meaning, but it's just so interesting to step back and just see how deeply these ideas are ingrained in people in our society. And I think it's time that we start questioning them because... Nobody else should should dictate how you want to look, right? And and the most important thing is how you feel and and being yourself. And you know, this reminds me of this story that I just read about this actress Justine Bateman, mm -hmm. who well, she's a director producer now, but it was an actress for many years. She's in Hollywood, and she just recently wrote a book called Face. And I believe the story is this book was inspired by the fact that someone told her she has to fix her face. They literally said to her you know, point blank, you need to fix your face hmm. because she has, she's in her fifties and she's decided not to do Botox or fillers or facelifts or anything like that, which is her prerogative. And, uh, 
it's just crazy because you do look around to the rest of Hollywood and you're kind of hard pressed to find anyone who's made that decision. And what's mind boggling to me is that you do see some of these celebrities like the JLo's and, you know, whoever else in their 50s who I love and who look youthful and amazing. And they're being praised in the media for being youthful. But then and their forehead doesn't move, but they tell you they're not using anything, you know, and then it makes you feel like, oh, what's wrong with me? Because, you know, my forehead does move and does have wrinkles. Okay, a few thoughts on that. I think I just want to comment on the the gray hair quickly, and then I want to come back to Botox and all. You know, my mom, she is 69 years old, and, you know, she looks so beautiful. She was never heavy on makeup, so, you know, her her skin is, you know, perfect. But, you know, she, she hates dyeing her hair because it's just time-consuming, and, yeah. and she thinks that it's, you know, uh, thinning her hair and so on. But... I just think that she's so beautiful and so young still, youthful, that why does she want to go gray? And as you know, you ladies know, I'm having my wedding this year. And I said, mommy, just just wait until the wedding. And if you want to go all gray, fine, but just don't do it for the wedding. But fundamentally, and I thought about this a lot, fundamentally, what that gray hair stands for, I don't think it has anything to do with aesthetics for me. It has to do with time. And I think with aging, that's the issue for me. I suppose I don't want to see the passing of time or I don't want to feel that my mom is getting older or I'm getting older because that means, okay, I'm having less time on this planet, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense, right? I'm having less time with my mom. I'm having, you know, less time with, you know, my my dad. I mean, my dad passed a few years ago, but I think for me, it's that sense of time that has passed rather than aesthetics but also as someone you know coming back to the cosmetic surgeries and you know botox and fillers and all that you know again i work in the media industry and you know i think obviously there's a lot of pressure to look a certain way when you're working in hollywood or the news or any sort of public entertainment right but at the same time fundamentally i think people need to do whatever hell they want to do Okay, if I like getting Botox or fillers or whatever, I do it because I want to, not because someone has told me or I want to look a certain way. So that's why I don't like when people, you know, in in the society want to put things in a box. You know, you, oh, you should look this way or you should do that way or you want, you know, you have to have this or that. No, if you don't like your nose, go get a nose job. You know, yeah, if you, course. if I don't like this wrinkle, I am going to go get Botox, right? <laughs> because I want to. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's because it's my choice, not because it's influenced by. And I someone. think that's, that's incredible. And I, I do like that. But the problem that I feel is that it's not always someone's decision like I feel like a lot of people are feeling pressured into it like they have to because it's everywhere and even so I did an episode a while back on Botox with Ray Chester which I think is a must listen to episode and I got a lot of comments from that but one woman had had wrote me and said you know I'm so glad you did this episode because I had recently went to my dermatologist just for a routine checkup and I went in feeling really good and then I, I got there And the dermatologist was asking me if I wanted to fill in the lines on my forehead that I hadn't even realized I had. And she's like, I walked out of there feeling really low because now I'm like, oh my God, is everyone looking at these lines? And, you know, should I do it? I never thought about it. I didn't really want to do it, but now maybe I should do it. My dermatologist is asking me. And that's where I feel like it's crossing the line when other people are trying to dictate to you how you should look. Or, and I imagine, especially women in media, like Justine Bateman had experience, and I'm sure many others, feeling this pressure from their job to have to do it. And that's where I think the problem is. And even I was talking to Jenny the other day, I was looking for a dermatologist because I'm back visiting New York and I was looking for a dermatologist just to do, again, like a regular checkup. It is so hard to find a dermatologist that's not doing cosmetic dermatology. They don't even have time. I, I, To get an appointment, it's three or four months out because they only have one day a week where they're doing regular yeah. dermatology. The yeah. other are cosmetics. Because that makes so, so much money. I'm sorry, but that that but makes so much no, money and it's not right. hard to do. You're right. But I, yeah, so I was talking to Maria about this. So I, I live in, yeah, live in New York City and I have very fair skin and I've had 
basal cells before that have to be removed. So I go get skin checks every six months and my dermatologist is fabulous. But the experience that this woman had who wrote to you, 100% had the same experience, but thankfully I didn't like upset me. I was just like, really? Because went to get my normal full body checkup the starting probably a couple years ago. And at the end, she's like, oh, and while you're here, if you want, I can do this line. And then she asked if I wanted laser for the like spots on my like sunspots. That's what I didn't realize. And I was like, do I have sunspots? Do I look like I have damaged skin? And was like slightly offended. But you're right. This is somebody who's supposed to just be doing skin checks for skin cancer, which is what I'm there for. And just, you know, casually like, oh, do you need this? And also, I mean, she's like one of the top dermatologists in the city and I love her, but you can, she only does full body skin checks one morning a week. And she does the procedures for basal cells you know, one morning every other week, because as I mean, Tara just said, yeah, that's like, that's how you make money. She also has her whole like skincare line now. And I kind of think that in dermatology, at least in Manhattan, you have to go that route. Like you can't just be a medical, medical, you know, straight. For sure. For sure. Everyone now, I mean, I live in London. Everyone has a skincare line and everyone's oh so groundbreaking and so special but but again this is a this is a very lucrative industry it makes a lot of money and you know it's not an expensive thing to put a filler or botox right. i mean you can you know do one in five minutes but i think it gets to a very sort of fundamental societal issue and i don't want to get philosophical here but i do think that you know, in the last maybe decade or so with social media and Instagram and, you know, keeping up with the Kardashians and, you know, all these people in mainstream media that young girls look at in ways perhaps aspire to, or if they're not aspiring to be like them, still encounter on a daily basis, the standards of how to look has perhaps shifted or changed. Not perhaps. It has definitely <laughs> changed. You see those memes on yes. Instagram where it's like me at 13 versus 13 yeah, year olds now. Right. And and I think, again, I really don't want to get philosophical here, but I genuinely think that, you know, parents or I just think that we need to reevaluate and kind of rethink these conversations and, and narratives and standards because I don't want to have, you know, a daughter who grows up looking at these people thinking that that's how it is. And I think in the U.S., you know, again, I compare U.S. to U.K. right now. I can't because I live there now. But it's just it's so much in your face here comparing to the rest of the world, at least from my experience. I don't know. So I just think this whole issue comes to so many root causes. What's it like right. in Dubai? Isn't yeah. that a big, I mean, it's, like, it's a so it's big, makeup, huge cosmetic, cosmetic dermatology industry. for sure. And makeup is, it's a huge, so huge market. With social media as well. Well, yeah. And I mean, now there's this whole, you know, increase and in influx of people going to the plastic surgeon and saying, I want to look like my filter. Yeah. They're literally showing pictures with their face filter That's and so saying, sad. I want to, but, it, but it's also crazy, right? Like, In my experience, when I was growing up, I remember being, I mean, I must have been 10, 12 years old. My mother had this friend who was older, June, and she was fully gray. She had went fully gray. And I thought she was so beautiful and elegant. Very and sophisticated. So sophisticated. sophisticated. She had the <laughs> softest silver, I would call it silver hair, which also, you know, I think there's such a... It's so interesting. We call a man a silver fox, mm, yeah. but a woman, a gray, you know, has gray well, hair. Well, now it's silver sister. Oh, oh, I love that. At least on Instagram. Yeah, I haven't heard that and term before, but I like it. I don't know what you're going to say, but I will say as I'm going gray, I have thought, thank God my grays are coming in pretty because oh. if they were like mousy and not so nice, I uh-huh. probably would just keep dying. Yeah. Well, so that's what I'm going to say. I remember, so so June, I just thought her hair was so beautiful. I used to, I literally, like, she would always like play with her hair and put it in a pony and take it out and tie it in a ribbon. And I, I thought it was so pretty. 
And then my mom would dye her her gray hairs. And I'd be like, you know, mom, why do you dye your gray hairs? And she's like, oh, trust me, when you have gray hair, you'll know why. <gasps> and I'm like, no, I'm going to go gray. I'm going to be like all silver hair like June. And let me tell you, I pluck them out the second they come in. And I mean, I only have a few and it comes in the same exact it, area. It makes it worse because when you pluck it, then it grows straight it up. Goes straight <laughs> up. But it's easier to pluck then. It's <laughs> true. So I have like five or seven that like just always come. It's always in the same exact spot. But anyway, so there's that. And, you know, now, okay, looking at the Kardashians, it's so interesting that we've got to see this family grow and evolve over, you know, a decade plus. And you see, though, how they looked before yeah. and what their life was like and how they look now perfectly symmetrical and perfectly, you know, like a face filter. <laughs> and they're billionaires, you know? So obviously, like, there's something to it. And for me, as someone who, like, always wants to be natural and organic and, and avoid, you know, toxins and all this stuff. I can understand, you know, the pull and the draw to do all of that. But, you know, this also to get philosophical, I think the issue that we have today is that for many women, we're basing our confidence and our self-worth on our looks. 100% and yeah. not on us. Yes. And, that, and that's what I think needs to change. And that's what I really want to convey especially to the young not even just the younger generation because <clears throat> women our age and even older yeah, i feel like we're, our, yeah. we're all we're all doing that no but you know like i think there are so many you know someone asked me the other day like who my my role models are and i i had to really think about it hmm. because like i mean growing up i don't know that i had like someone in my life that i felt like like a female like a strong female that was you know, a, a great role model. Now, now I do, but definitely you're my role model, <laughs> or the most influential person in my life. <laughs> I love you, Jenny. <laughs> no, but I, I didn't have like a strong female in my life growing up, and I didn't have someone to look at. And I love my mother, but you know, yeah. she would always criticize her looks, and yeah. even when she was at her, you know, she's still beautiful, but like her most beautiful she'd still there oh. was something to pick at there was something oh, wrong I, i'm too fat i'm too this i'm too this i'm too that and it was she was never good enough and it's hmm. you know you pick up on those things as a kid oh my mom it was gonna be her present when i graduated from college was a facelift like this she talked about it all the time for years her and her best friend was their like joke but not a joke she didn't get it her friend did <laughs> Yeah, I just, I, my mom was never like that. My mom but you was, also, your mom didn't, is not from the U.S., right? That's the thing. She grew and, up. And that's what I want to talk about as well. It's so interesting. Again, you know, I'm Iranian-American. I lived half of my life in Iran and half, you know, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my parents were here in late 60s, 70s. So, she, you know, in, to an extent, she was Americanized, right? But in Iran, again, I don't want to go off tangent, but, it, but it's quite fascinating because, you know, since the revolution, women have to wear scarves okay so you can't be all dressed up you know hair done and so on and you know go on the street this hijab was was very strict in the early years of the revolution okay so from 79 to mid 90s was it was quite strict but then slowly 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 it loosened up right so if you go to iran right now i mean you'd see girls with super super tight you know, outer coats and super colorful scarves and, you know, half of the hair is out from the front, half of the hair is, you know, d d out in the back. And, and mind you, that cosmetic surgery is so big in Iran. Okay. Huge. It, actually, a lot of people just, just go to Iran from the region to get their nose jobs. And one of the reasons, guys, is because that generation was so stifled mm -hmm. and constrained that the only thing that they could show was their face, yeah. right. right? So the more makeup they, you know, they put on, the prettier they felt, and and right. the, the more they felt they're being seen, because otherwise they were restricted. Yeah. If that makes sense, right? And I found again in my travels and my work is that you know the more you restrict a society, the more that ambition and desire to set free would come out. And that's why you in the Middle East, you know, these women cover their hairs, mm -hmm. right? 
But then again, the amount of makeup on their face is, is, is crazy. And if it's about being modest and, you know, like a, a, a modest woman, that certainly does not look modest to me. Well, I, but look, I think that to each their own. And if that makes someone feel strong and powerful and beautiful, then, you know, just like you said earlier, then so be it. Yeah, of course. Exactly. 100%. If that's, you know, your prerogative, you want to do that, yes. But coming back to the whole philosophical thing, you know, again, based on my experience, so many of these issues come down to how the society has made you feel, right? Yeah. That, that a woman is only beautiful, you know, to this extent. This is what we're seeing. So that needs to be pretty. Right. Or th- this is the this beautiful is, face. Right. Exactly. One thing that is just mind boggling to me is that you go on social media, everybody looks exactly the same. Yeah. And, and you, you, two completely different people, you, you, they look like twins. It's, yeah. It's mind-boggling. I know, and it's, and it's and I remember there was a friend of mine. She was having a birthday maybe a couple of weeks ago, and I kid you not, there was no one picture that she liked taking. I mean, she yeah. kept like, doing filters, and she kept doing you know these poses, and I'm like, I'm so sick and tired of this. You just take a freaking picture, and well, I'm, I, I, I can't. but I think that's such a common thing. You know, we look at ourselves in pictures, and, and we all do this. I mean, I, I'm definitely I'm like. Do it, and of course. Like, I don't do like it, but, but it has. But but with, with this was so obsessive that I didn't even. You know, we all do it. Of course, I do it too. I mean, I take a yeah. ton of picture, but 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 I, it's it's because we are. First of all, we're fixated on our flaws because, again, in marketing messaging, that's all we're taught. We're told we have to fix something. We have to fix the line. We have to fix this. We have to fix our lips. Our lips have to be bigger. This has to. Our nose has to be smaller. Our cheeks have to be lifted. There's always something to fix. And I think it's this combination of social media, Mm -hmm. regular media, even friends and family, women, there's just this crazy pressure to look a certain way. And I, this is a big reason I wanted to have this conversation because of course, as a woman, as a person, do whatever you want. It's your prerogative, but also don't feel like you have to do these things. Like you don't have to fix your face. Yeah. Your face is perfect. You know, it doesn't matter. You're not 20 anymore. You don't have to look like you're 20 when you're 50. Right. And this is something we glorify. <laughs> and like, look, it's nice. I would like to remain young forever. <laughs> like I'm not going to lie, but, and it's a practice to, to, Stop criticizing yourself. Like I know when, for me, I definitely growing up, I would criticize myself. And I think that was a habit that I learned from my parents. But when I started shifting towards a healthier lifestyle and I did struggle with acne, which was really, really hard on my self-confidence and self-worth. But something that really helped me get over that was focusing more on appreciating my body, focusing on nourishing my body, focusing on gratitude and really being mindful when I did say those negative things or have those negative thoughts that I cut myself off right away. And this is something you I taught teach me in the that. class. Yeah. So if you say, okay, you know, oh, I'm so ugly, you have to stop yourself right away and replace it with at least two positive thoughts. And, you know, yeah. I'm so beautiful. I'm so thankful, you know, that, that I have skin, that I have a face, that I have right. legs to run, that, you know, I'm strong, that I'm whatever. You have to just get in the habit of doing that. And then eventually the amount of times you say something negative about yourself just starts to decrease, decrease, and the positive things increase. And another thing that's been really helpful for me more recently, interestingly, is, well, now that I'm living in Dubai, uh, I don't even go out in the sun, but I, you know, there's windows, obviously, and I'm noticing that I have some more freckles on my face. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I don't want these freckles. But I started doing face yoga, which, by the way, is amazing. Yeah, we, we, <laughs> we need to talk about that. It totally changes your face, like, in a positive way. I mean, talk about if you want to go the natural way and not do fillers and facelifts and all this stuff, this stuff really works. But my friend, uh, Catherine, who's probably listening, hi, Kat, introduced me to face yoga, and I did her 21-day challenge. And basically what it is, is you sit in the mirror and you do these different exercises with your face. You look really funny. And 20 minutes sounds like a long time to stare at yourself in the mirror. And it is. But while I was doing it and massaging the oil and doing the face. We're doing it now. (laughs) I I was like, you know what? I like my freckles. You know, I love my freckles. I love. I've always had freckles and I love them. They're my favorite. Yeah. And I just, I don't know. Like, I just became more comfortable with my face, I guess. And interestingly, I feel like I had these things, things were not perfectly symmetrical. And 
through doing the face yoga, they became more symmetrical. And even because it's all, it's also lymphatic drainage, I thought my face looked fine before, but then after doing this for 21 days, I was like, wow, my face looks amazing because it's very subtle differences, but like the nose was sleeker, the, mm-hmm. the jawline was sleeker, the, the cheekbones looked more, more elevated and it, yeah, face yoga, I can't, I can't speak about it highly enough. Yeah. We talked about that. I started somebody else's program, not your friends, which I never finished. And I really would like to restart it, but yeah, it wasn't until I guess sometime this winter where all of a sudden one day I like realized, Oh my God, I have really bad. There was 11 lines. Like, do I frown all the time? I must, I don't know. And the three like pretty deep lines in my forehead that I never noticed before. And I wanted to do something. So I need to get into it and actually commit to it. But it was fun. And also something that I do do just more of soothing, like self soothing than anything is the gua sha gua sha stones, however you say it, Yeah, I find is like a very nice ritual. And actually, when I'm anxious, kind of just like soothes my whole body. And that does help smooth out things as well. And I think, you know, we're talking about face yoga, but fundamentally, you know, what I'm hearing, because, you know, I've never tried it. I've I've seen it done. It's about values. You know, you are valuing a sort of internalized way of dealing with whatever it is that you want to deal with, right? On, you know, aesthetically on your face or if it makes you feel good. And I think going back to, you know, the earlier point about the society, I think we should start changing or shifting our values to what matters or what what is really meaningful. And and Jenny, you said it, you know, why is it that aesthetics have to define who we are or the way we look? And and I think we are all individually responsible to to living by these, you know, more positive values that don't just reduce us to, oh, how you know, tiny her nose is or how big her lips is or how... Yeah. When you were teaching us about, um, you know, saying nice things to yourself, that was so foreign to me. I remember like passing in front of a window once and and forcing myself and I couldn't think of a nice thing Mm. to say. And it actually was, I guess now two, maybe two and a half years ago, but what I did and it was so uncomfortable, but I started... I would every morning, and this is not about aging, but every morning I had gotten out of the shower, looked at myself in the mirror, and I would just, without even realizing, say everything that was not nice and ugly and that I didn't like. And I forced myself to hold a rose quartz on my heart and look at myself nude in the mirror and say, Jenny Sachs, I love you. You are beautiful. And like, I couldn't get the words out when I first started. And I, and then I put the rose quartz in my bra and wear it around all day. And I think after three months, I one day realized like, wow, you love yourself. You don't even need to say it anymore. And now I really don't say nasty things to myself anymore, which is amazing because it's not nice to not be nice to yourself. But yeah, once you really love your body, then you can, I guess, start, you know. I mean, you could do anything. Do, do anything. Yeah, I mean, these really. values change. I mean, exactly. And you just get out of your own way, you know, because, yes. and we talked about this, when you're hating on yourself, you can't change. No. Because you're always punishing yourself and mm-hmm. berating yourself. And I mean, just think about it. If you were to do that to another person, how are they going to respond? Yeah, they would run away from you. They wouldn't want to be around you. They wouldn't want to be with you. And they're probably not going to change. And this is, you know, like when you see people like fighting on social media and stuff. And it's like, if you want someone to change or look at something differently, you can't berate them, belittle them, make them feel stupid or inconsequential. No, you have to make them feel good. You know, you have to do it nicely and do it from a place of love and respect. And when you do it that way, then yeah, people's minds can change and it just changes everything. So, so likewise with yourself, if you want to say, start a a new health regimen, you have to start doing it from a place of, I love myself and I want to nourish myself versus I hate myself. and I'm going to punish myself by going to the gym and eating this broth. 
So, you know, when we lost dad 10 years ago, my mom and I started doing the, this yoga, which is, you know, a Korean discipline. And, you know, my mom uh, kept on doing it and she's been doing it now for 10 years and actually she teaches. But, but I remember one of the first things that, you know, we were told and taught is self-love and self-acceptance. And as simple as that sounds, it's something that we didn't do. And to Jenny's point, you know, it's, it, it was, it's something that truly, truly changed my mom's life. And from that day on, or from that second or third class, whenever that was, you know, the, the, the training was, you know, every morning you wake up and you have to say, you know, Tara, I love you. You are beautiful. I love you. And I was like, oh, God, like, mm-hmm. OK. Um, but, you know, my mom has been doing that every single day. And quite frankly, I see the change in her face, in her mood, in her in, her, in everything. And for the listeners who may never, you know, have done this, I truly have seen the life-changing impact. And and quite frankly, I wish I would do it every day because I'm very hard on myself. And Maria knows this. I'm super, super hard on myself. And, you know, again, aesthetically, whatever change I bring to my hair, face, body, whatever, it genuinely is because I want it. You know, I want it, not because of anything else. And and I, I, again, I think fundamentally the reasons behind the why we want to look a certain way is so important. Yeah. And I think one important observation is that I feel when you're really happy, happy with yourself, you're at peace with mm-hmm. yourself, just happy in life. Also, you just radiate, you glow, yeah. you know, you, you, you automatically look better mm-hmm. because it's just something internal, you yeah, know, and sure. when you're stressed, things go that go the opposite And you way. pick on yourself. I mean, you're stressed, yeah. you pick on yourself. Oh my God, like this is this, this is that. But if yeah. you're genuinely psychologically internally happy, yeah, you would not want to have a, you know, bigger nose or, oh, sorry, th- thinner nose. I don't know, a smaller uh, yeah. nose. Yeah. You, you, but it also physically has consequences, stress. Sure. Like right. I... More Jenny stories. I'm working, you know, now with a doctor, a naturopathic doctor, because I have histamine intolerance. And one of her biggest things is stay away from stress, because when I get really stressed, I mean, I had my first flight since COVID a month ago and just follow like, like leading up to flying my eczema on my hand like flared up and was out of control like when i'm stressed my face is puffy i wake mm-hmm. up and i look like i was drinking you know tequila yeah. all night i just like <laughs> you actually get inflamed stress course, is a huge sure. Im- you know causes inflammation in your body yeah and inflammation degrades our collagen mm-hmm. uh and obviously sets up a whole negative uh, chain of events in the body. So I think if we want to stay young and beautiful, some of the best things that we can do are one, learn to love ourselves and be comfortable and happy with ourselves. Stop stressing. Number two, this is a big one for health overall. I think this is such a game changer. And I think a lot of us get into healthy living through food and nutrition or exercise. Those are the two kind of gateways into healthy living. But what I've learned over the years, and as important as both of those things are, and they are important and do make a big impact, it's learning to deal with your stress that is ultimately going to be the game changer for your life. And when you can learn to control your thoughts, life becomes infinitely better. It's like a weight is lifted off your shoulders to not have the stress and the fear. And it's that doesn't mean that your life becomes perfect. It doesn't mean you don't have stressors in your life or bad things don't happen to you. No, it doesn't mean that. It means that you develop this unbreakable, unshakable mindset. Resilience. You, you Exactly, resilience. That anything that comes your way, you know that you're not going to break. You're going to bounce back. Yeah. And I think that also just gives us this glow and this longevity. And, you know, we see in all these studies of places where people live to 100 and, and upwards, it's also it's it's that it's having a purpose it's also relationships so there's so many other factors i think that contribute to our health to our glow and i think those are the things i mean that i personally want to want to focus on and yeah i want to do face yoga too because i feel like that makes a big difference mental health i mean i think during covid i realized and i was always a you know big mental health advocate my charity focuses on mental health for for children in uh you know vulnerable communities and for refugees, but mental health is perhaps the root 
cause of so many of you know the issues that we deal with or would happen to us i mean if mentally we're healthy emotionally we're we're vibrant that shows and that reflects because you know the same way that your you know feet hurt when you're walking have you ever thought about your brain hurting i mean yeah. we may physically not feel it it might I mean not mm-hmm. it may not be pinching but it's hurting and we need to care about our brain the same that we do about our body or skin and and again fundamentally for me it comes to mental health yeah Yeah. i think another maybe blessing in disguise from covid is i do think that mental health is now more uh, like a talked about and central conversation less taboo yeah it's something that i've always talked about and been very vocal personally but um, almost nobody else is kind of like previous to COVID and I'm always shocked when I hear people say like therapy is not, you know, looked bad upon by their family or anything like that. And I'm so glad that now it's, you know, much more accepted, I think. And and, and I want to share this, you know, Maria, you know this, but Jenny, um, when I'm going through stress and when I'm emotionally, you know, in a volatile state, I may not pick on myself aesthetically. Oh, you know, my skin is this or I'm too fat or I'm too thin or I'm too whatever. I become a hypochondriac. I'm like, oh, my God, I have breast cancer now. Oh, my God, I have like a tumor in my head. Oh, my God, I have like... I've been on the receiving end of all of these calls. (laughs) Exactly. You know what I mean? That's how my mental health manifests. And for some people, they're like, oh, you know, maybe I need to do this to my face or that or I look too old or I look too this or... Do you see what I mean? And I have, I've learned this. I mean, I know that when I'm going through some emotional phase or I'm stressed, I mean, this last year with the book, I was just losing it, right? You know, I was constantly thinking that I'm dying or even with COVID, I was, you know, in in Stockholm. So you did get it and you were very sick. Right, right. But, you know, we were in Stockholm with my fiance and I mean, it's a beautiful town, but I didn't know anyone. You know, I had this very mundane routine. And again, you both know I'm someone that needs to be super social. I'm out and about. I need to be plugged in. But I wasn't, right? And I got very depressed June, July. And I really thought that I'm developing, you know, an eye disease or, you know, I kept calling my my doctor friends and I'm like, you know, my, my, my boob, one of them is bigger than the other. Am I, you know, having breast cancer, uh, breast cancer? You shouldn't yeah. be like laughing, but <laughs> no, but, no, it's, no, but yeah. here's the thing. I am aware of that, right? Self-awareness is Self-awareness. the most important right. thing. And my point is that mental health instability or emotional instability led me to be physically you know, vulnerable in this yeah. way, but others may pick on their aesthetics. And that's, again, it goes back to my initial point. I was saying, you know, values, emotional state, and really how you feel internally really reflects what you want externally. A hundred percent. And I just wanted to say, I'm so glad, like, you know, I love this <laughs> podcast, but I'm so glad that you do this podcast and there's so many people now that are um, resources for everyone because honestly, before either you talked about it on a podcast or we talked about it, I don't know, but I never, it literally did not process in my mind that Botox is toxic, that that is, that that's part of the name and that there could be anything you know, again, yeah, everybody do what they want to do, but that it's not, what I'm trying to say is I just thought it was completely normal and that's what you do. And there's nothing to even think about. And I didn't pick on things at the time. So I didn't think I needed it, but had I not learned these things from you, maybe when I went to the doctor next week for my Mm -hmm. six month checkup and she said that I wouldn't even think twice, of course, give me Botox. Like that's what you do. So I'm just really glad that there's, you know, you're putting this information out there. Yeah. And I feel like I, I also, you know, with so much filtering and Photoshopping and Botoxing on, <laughs> on Instagram and social media. I feel like I just want to be give be an example that you don't have to do these things yes. to feel good. Like if you want to do them, fine, but you don't have to. And yeah, I mean the thing with Botox, like if they were injecting, I don't know, chlorophyll or something, I'd probably do it. But <laughs> but 
because it is a toxin and if you guys listen to the Botox episode, just it's definitely a listen if you're thinking about it or if you're doing it. But uh, I had done Botox as a teenager under my arm. That's what I was going to do it when I was younger. Also yeah. for, for excessive sweating. Exactly. So when I was a teenager, I had excessive sweating and like also just talk about bad karma because let me just I have to t- tell the story to get it off my chest. But like I was fine. And then I had this teacher in the 10th grade who would sweat excessively (laughs) and he'd always be pointing at pictures of the map. I know it's so terrible. And he'd always wear these blue shirts and you can see, and it literally, I would say it looks like an ocean under his arm. It was such a big sweat stain. So I was kind of like making fun of him, bad Maria. And I I developed the issue. Okay. (laughs) So I think that was definitely bad karma. But anyway, So I remember being in a nail salon, reading one of these celebrity tabloid magazines and reading that all these celebrities, it was uh, award season and all the celebrities were getting Botox injections under their arms so that they wouldn't sweat in their gowns. Like, wow, this this sounds great. I sweat through all my my T-shirts and all my clothes. Let 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 me go do this. So I went to my dermatologist, asked him to do it. He said, yes. I I didn't even think twice because, you know, you think your doctor knows best and whatever. So he also, obviously 16, 17 years old, whatever I was like, I don't know where my lymph nodes are (laughs) under my arm. Mm -hmm. Right. And not even thinking twice about injecting a toxin, a actually the most potent toxin known to man. Really? Yeah. Botulinum toxin is considered the, the most potent, the potent toxin. You're still and, doing it, Tara? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've had friends listen to the episode and be like, I don't care. I'm still doing it. So again, it's each your own. We, everyone has to do their risk You do you. Yes. yes. <laughs> no, but so I, I did it and it didn't work for me or it worked in one arm. And, you know, two weeks later, I went back and I said, I'm still sweating on this arm. So they, they injected it again, which I've since learned is a big no-no because there's a certain, there's a maximum you amount you're sweat. supposed to. Well, yeah. there, well, not even that you have to sweat. Yes, that's actually so another step, issue yeah. is that you do you are supposed to sweat right. and the, the other issue is why don't you find out why i'm sweating excessively right. because we're, we're sweating to excrete so there's obviously some sort of yeah. underlying imbalance and i can say later on through t- traditional chinese medicine by adding more acidic foods into my diet i found that i sweat less and sort of balance things i don't know why i sweat so much when i was younger and in my 20s but once i switched over to natural deodorant from your yeah. guidance Though it does take a lot of different tries, let me just say, to find the right one. But I realized that a couple of weeks ago, like, I don't sweat at all a lot anymore. Yeah. I so, like natural deodorants. Yeah. I have a good one. I can't think of a name, but. Yeah. Primally Pure, which. Primally Pure, yes. You, it's great. So you can use the code Maria. Oh, what is it? I think it's Maria 10 for 10% off. <laughs> <laughs> the best natural deodorant. I have to say, speaking of Botox, you know, I've gotten it. I will probably get it. I don't even think you can tell. Can you tell? No. Okay. Because I mean, why would you be able to? That's that's the thing. Again, you do it because you want you you don't want people to see it. Yeah. And again, you people need to do what makes, makes them feel good, yeah. right? I didn't do it because I had wrinkles. I just wanted to because I didn't want to because I do this a lot. And I do uh-huh. some TV. Yeah, a lot. that's what I. Yeah, and, and I know that life. if I don't get it done, this will continue happening, and I would you know do this, and you know I'm 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 a happy bunny. But the point is right now, again, because of the societal pressure, I feel every, you know, Tom, Dick and Harry is injecting Botox. I mean, it's so easy to get licensed or trained to do, you know, injectables right now that any nurse practitioner, anyone literally can do it. And I think people who are who are interested in doing this need to go to someone, number one, obviously legit, but also you know, understand the product that they're using or understand, yeah. you know, the, the clientele that they've had, the the reviews, do your research. Don't just go to someone, you know, inexpensive because you're saving a couple hundred dollars. Um, you're putting something in your body, you're injecting something into in your, your face. face. So you definitely don't want to be frugal or cheap on this because right now there's so many yeah. nasty products no and group incapable <laughs> Are you know incapable people yeah. out there, and and yeah. who are taking advantage of this? Yeah, I'm sure of this yeah. demand and people, especially young people's naiveness. Do, yeah. do you see what I mean? And I think you know your doctor that you know you were 16, 17. He or she should have explained to you. And and well, that's gone the thing. Over this. Well, that's the thing. They don't. They you know, don't. When yeah. you go to the doctor, so here's the thing. So definitely, again, listen to the other podcast episode with Ray Chester, who is a lawyer. Long story short, Botox has what's called a black box warning on it now 
which is a warning that basically lets you know that you're doing this at your own risk. Oh, if you sure. have any complications, you can't sue. You have no, you have no recourse. Really? Basically. Yes. It's take at your own risk. You now, here's consent. the thing. Well, no, here's the thing. They're kind of supposed to show this to you, but I know in fact, I mean, I know that it wasn't shown to me and maybe the black box warning was not in existence back then, but I mean, do you, so do you, when you do it, do you sign something? Yeah. You sign a consent and it, it tells you all of the side effects, possible side effects. <laughs> Okay, I never read the whole thing. Well, exactly. Yeah. That's you know, you're like, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So people don't it's know. It's so common yeah. and mainstream that, as I said, I wouldn't even think twice about doing it. Okay, but I have to say twice. something here. Exactly. Yeah. So most people probably don't. Taking, taking you back to Iran, a very dear family friend of ours, their son, he... Um, you know, and he's in his late twenties. He he does sports. I mean, he's very handsome, and you know, fit and whatnot. And he had excessive sweating, right? So he apparently had gone in to this, you know, whatever doctor to Botox under his arm. So he does that, and then you know, a month later, this is maybe three four years ago, he started getting very sick. And I'm not quite sure exactly, you know, what the issue was, but it got to a point where he was almost in a coma. And, and was in the hospital for two weeks. No one knew what's wrong with him. He was so ill that, you know, he, he almost lost his life. You know, I mean, this is, this is a couple years ago. And it got to a point where, I don't know, the, the, their aunt from Germany consulted with the doctor. And then, you know, something happened, something happened. So finally, they figured out that he had gotten Botox under the arm. And that product was you know, something they got on the black market because, you know, all the, you know, sanctions and all the, you know, black market related issues in Iran, whatever. So that was just some nasty product and it didn't work. And it was just, you know, Mm -hmm. it caused this, but it took them two weeks to figure this out. This kid almost died. I mean, it was just a disaster. So my point is, it's so important to know what you're doing. It's so important to know who you're doing it. It's so important to know what the product is. And yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the biggest takeaways I think here are one, you don't need to fix your face, but if you okay. want to go for it. So it's, it's or your hair your, or your hair. Exactly. You don't need to change. You don't need to impress anyone. Yeah. It, you just love yourself. To, yeah, exactly. And derive your confidence from your being, not from your looks. I think that's super important. Find your happiness because that will automatically make you look better mm-hmm. and <laughs> just being happy. And what else? What are the things that you hope women will will take away from this? I mean, I always think about my my grandmother and mother who always told me beauty comes from within. Beauty comes from the heart. And I think we should practice that a a little bit more, especially Mm -hmm. in this day and age. Well, you're lucky that you had wonderful mother and grandmother. I mean, I did as well, but they didn't give me those. um, (laughs) Those (laughs) words of wisdom. Words of wisdom. I think it's just do what you want to do don't listen to other people and live your life like for other people and it will bring you so much more peace and happiness i love it well one last question that i always end all my podcasts with i'll ask you each if there's one tip or piece of advice you can leave our listeners with to live a happier and healthier life what would that be Love yourself. Wake up every day loving yourself and be grateful for the fact that you woke up. I don't want to just repeat what Tara said. (laughs) And I've listened to all of your podcasts. I forgot that you asked this question. I should have had something prepared. Just your, we only have one life and you only have one body and just be so grateful and thankful and Treat your body with love and kindness. Tara, Jenny, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and insights this episode. And for any of our listeners who want to add to the conversation, head over to Instagram at Maria Marlowe and Marlowe has a W-E at the end to continue the conversation.